You know, it never ceases to amaze me the kind of shit that can go wrong behind the scenes in Hollywood. Whether it's nightmarish shooting conditions, the clashing egos of dickhead actors, or just bloated productions that descend into generalised insanity, certain movies have become almost legendary for how difficult they were to make. And damn, I've had a great old time pointing and laughing at them here. <laughs> but the one thing they all had in common is that they at least managed to get made in the first place. For better or worse, the director was able to put a finished product up on the big screen for us to laugh at. It might not have been the one he wanted, but at least it was a film of some sort. But there's one movie that's gone down in infamy as the most expensive film that never was. A bloated, chaotic, creatively unfocused, misbegotten got an attempt to reinvigorate a classic comic book character, brought down by a combination of poor hiring choices, constant studio interference, conflicting ideas, and ridiculous casting decisions. I'm talking, of course, about Superman Lives. Or Superman Reborn. Or Batman vs Superman. Or Superman Flyby, depending on how far you want to go down that particular rabbit hole. But whatever shitty name you want to slap on it, the point is that this movie was an absolute disaster from start to finish, wasting five entire years and tens of millions of dollars without shooting a single frame. And since it's fun to look back on some of Hollywood's most embarrassing failures, let's kick off the next instalment of... PRODUCTION HELL! To understand how exactly this clusterfuck came to be, I need to take you back in time to 1987 with the release of Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. I mean, I could probably make another production hell video based entirely around that movie, but the short version is that it was a bomb, desperately sharted out by a studio that was both creatively and financially bankrupt. Pretty much everyone hated it, including Christopher Reeve, and it basically killed the prospect of further Superman films for at least a decade. In fact, the character in general was going through some pretty tough times round about then. Having been around for more than 50 years, he was seen as tired, dated and unfashionable by the early 90s, and sales of the comics were plummeting. Clearly something needed to change, and as it turned out, that change came in the form of the Death of Superman storyline, where he basically got killed in an epic battle with Doomsday, and ultimately resurrected. It was a pretty smart move, and it provided the shot in the arm needed to revive the character. Needless to say, Hollywood saw an opportunity to do the same thing with the movie version, so Warner Brothers snapped up the rights in 1993 and set about writing a new script based on the death of Superman, this time called Superman Reborn. Nice one, chaps. Unfortunately, the guy they chose to write it had no fucking experience with comic books and even less understanding of the Superman character. Amongst the creative gems in his script, you would have seen Clark Kent visiting a therapist, getting into relationship problems with Lois, and wearing a robotic suit to fight Doomsday after losing his superpowers. It was pretty shit to be honest, and Warner Brothers knew it, so they brought in more people to try to rewrite it. But instead of cutting out the bad stuff and replacing it with something better, all they really managed to do was add in more characters and subplots, which further muddied the waters. And after plugging away at this shit for three years, it was pretty obvious the project was going nowhere. But cometh the hour, cometh the man, and in this case, the man in question was a talented young screenwriter named Kevin Smith. Now, these days old Kevin is best known as a shameless Disney shill, desperately hoping to score a gig with them, and endlessly dining out on the, uh, glory days of Jay and Silent Bob. But back in the mid-90s, he was a rising star fresh off the success of Mallrats. And say what you want about the guy, but he knows his shit when it comes to comic books. Discarding the completely unworkable script for Superman Reborn, he pitched a whole new idea to John Peters, the head of Warner Brothers. It was still based on the Death of Superman comic, featuring Brainiac and Lex Luthor teaming up to destroy Superman, but it was much more focused and true to the characters. According to Smith, Peters loved his ideas and commissioned him to write a new script, on three conditions. One, Superman doesn't fly. Two, he doesn't wear his red and blue costume. Three, he has to fight a giant spider in the finale. <laughs> what? He also demanded the inclusion of a robotic dog for merchandising reasons and an android assistant for Brainiac that he described as, and I quote, a gay R2-D2 with attitudes. <laughs> 
<laughs> By the way, if you ever need help figuring out whether something was designed in the 1990s, just look for the word attitude. It'll be in there somewhere, trust me. Needless to say, all this stuff wasn't great news for Smith. Instead of writing his own story, he was basically just there to implement John Peters' increasingly shit ideas. But if you're a comic book fan, and you've got the chance to write a Superman script, well, I guess you find a way to make it work. And that's exactly what he did. His finished script was called Superman Lives, and somehow he managed to incorporate all the studio demands while telling a mostly coherent story. Peters and the rest of the guys at Warner Brothers were satisfied, and the movie went into pre-production. Now what they really needed was a director, and that's where things started to go wrong. Kevin Smith pitched the idea of Tim Burton directing because he'd done great work with Batman and directed a string of hits, so he was red hot in Hollywood at the time. It's a nice sentiment, but in retrospect, it was a bit like a turkey proposing the idea of Thanksgiving. <laughs> Tim Burton took one look at his script and refused to work with it, so Smith was politely asked to leave the project, while Burton brought in his own people to rewrite the script. Pretty soon, the whole movie took on a darker, edgier tone. Superman was reimagined into a broody, angsty, socially awkward outsider, pondering existential questions about the nature of humanity and his place in the world. Needless to say, this isn't the kind of character that a guy like Christopher Reeve could play. Reeve was too old by this point, and a tragic accident had left him paralysed from the neck down, so a new actor was going to have to be brought in to play Superman. And as it turns out, the actor they wanted was Nick Cage. These days, he's basically a walking meme, churning out 10 direct-to-DVD movies a year in a never-ending quest to dig himself out of that tax hole. Those Bavarian castles aren't going to pay for themselves, Nick. But back in the late 90s, he was still a big box office draw, and he was already a big fan of the Superman character, so he had no problem signing on, especially since he was guaranteed $20 million whether the film even got made or not. The point is, this combination of gothic art house director, questionable actor, and a general culture of trying to make everything cool and edgy created the perfect storm of pretentious, late 90s shittiness. Leaked footage of Nick Cage screen testing different Superman costumes gives you some idea of what they were going to do with this. It looks cheap and plasticky and goofy as fuck, and the idea of this guy playing the world's most iconic superhero just seems, well, as laughable as it sounds. Michael Keaton managed to get away with his clunky bat suit because he was shot in virtual darkness, but with Superman, there would be nowhere to hide from it. To make matters worse, Burton's new script called for a budget of $190 million, which in today's money is around $300 million, making it easily one of the most expensive movies ever made. Naturally, Warner Brothers were starting to get a bit nervous about this. Not only was the film years behind schedule, but it was also shaping up to be their biggest financial gamble of all time. And as they just recently learned from Batman and Robin, these gambles don't always pay off. Further script rewrites were ordered to trim the budget by about 50%. These rewrites, combined with constant interference and demands from Peters, pissed off Burton and forced repeated delays. They'd already spent about $30 million by this point, and apart from a few half-hearted screen tests, they'd basically accomplished fuck all. Sets were built and dismantled without warning or explanation. Art and costume departments produced wild concepts for alien monsters, antagonists, environments and equipment without being told what they were for or how they'd fit into the story. It was a production trapped firmly in development hell, unable to move forward but with too much invested to be shut down. Eventually, it was all too much for Tim Burton, and he dropped out of the project to direct Sleepy Hollow instead. The studio briefly considered an entirely new script called Man of Steel, before going back to the original Tim Burton version. The problem is that it was a very Tim Burton kind of script, and nobody else was willing to direct it. Michael Bay, Oliver Stone, Brett Ratner and Simon West were all approached, and all of them turned it down. The departure of Nick Cage in June 2000 was the final nail in the coffin for Superman Lives, and production was shut down completely. It would be another six years before a new Superman movie finally got made, in the form of Superman Returns. Funnily enough, it contains none of the elements that would have been in Superman Lives, because apparently the studio were so fucking disgusted by the debacle that they refused to even talk about it again. Honestly, when I think about the time, money and creative energy that must have been wasted on Superman Lives, it's hard to think of a better example of studio mismanagement, miscommunication, and sheer fucking Hollywood hubris. 
It feels like a movie that everyone wanted to see, but nobody really understood how to make. A film spawned from a single good idea, and then blown on the winds of whatever seemed cool and edgy at the time. They used the Death of Superman comic because it was a cool and edgy story. They hired Tim Burton because he was a cool and edgy director. They hired Nicolas Cage because he was a cool and edgy actor. They even retooled Superman's personality and appearance to make him what they considered to be cool and edgy. Now that's great and everything, but the problem is that one decade's cool and edgy is another decade's dated and cheesy. And truly, there are a few things more dated and cheesy than late 90s comic book movies. Superman as a character is supposed to be timeless and classic. That's the reason he's been around longer than your fucking granddad. And trying to make him fit in with whatever fashions and fads happened to be in vogue at the time just proves that you can only bend the character so far before he breaks. Of course, the one question we'll never be able to answer is, could Superman Lives actually have been any good? I mean, I'll be honest with you here, as a film critic, the idea of Tim Burton directing Nick Cage in a robotic Superman costume as he fights the giant spider sent by Christopher Walken just sounds... fucking awesome, man. But probably not in the way Warner Brothers intended. Tim Burton certainly has a niche as a director, and he did a lot to erase the campy Adam West TV show from the Batman legacy, but honestly, I really can't imagine him directing an epic Superman film. Likewise, Nick Cage was a great performer in his day, and as much as I respect their willingness to cast unconventional actors in well-known roles, the sad fact is, not everyone can play every character. That's why you don't see Melissa McCarthy as Wonder Woman. Could Nick Cage play a fucking alien struggling to fit into human society? Absolutely, he's been doing it his whole life. But could he convincingly play Superman? Are you serious? Also, this film would have come along at a pretty rough spell for comic book movies, when the Batman franchise was busy being Joel schumacher into campy, cartoonish oblivion. In fact, I actually heard rumours that they were planning to tie Superman Lives into some kind of fucked up shared DC universe, a full decade before the MCU was even a thing. And if that's the case, damn, the mind boggles at what gems might have come out of it. Could you really imagine the Joel Schumacher Batman teaming up with Nick Cage to fight cosmic supervillains? Not a great plan. Ultimately then, Regardless of what it might have become, Superman Lives should probably be remembered as a cautionary tale for movie producers today. It's exactly the kind of mess that happens when there's too much money, too much interference, too many competing ideas, and no strong creative vision to tie it all together and drive it forward to completion. And the end result is $30 million spent on, well, nothing at all. Damn, I could think of better ways to spend that kind of money. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.